Welcome to another episode of Heroines of Hometown History. Jonathan Moore here again with Hometown Historian Channel. Um, this week, uh, for Heroines of Hometown History, uh, we're doing an episode here on Mary Sachs, who was uh, very renowned in the fashion world, uh, and for several other different things as well as we'll discuss in the video. Uh, I think vaguely I remember hearing the name but didn't really know a single thing about her. And it just happened to be up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, trying to get some of this unemployment stuff resolved. And that was an interesting story in and of itself. Uh, but where I had, I parked, uh, I had to put some money in the bank so I could put a meter money in because I didn't have any enough quarters on me to do it because parking's expensive in Harrisburg. But uh, since I parked there, paid my four bucks for parking, I decided I'm going to go over to uh, State Capitol, which is right across the street, take a bunch of pictures, do the video, and all that. And that wound up being a lot more than I thought it was going to be. And it was actually a really cool experience. I hadn't been there since since I was a kid uh, for a school trip. But across the street from where I parked was this building that said Mary Sachs. And right where I had uh, parked, there was a placard there that gave the history of this lady. And... Uh, Pretty basic information, uh, but it was pretty cool information. I was like, yeah, I'm going to take pictures of this stuff, take pictures of the Mary uh, Sachs building and then the Lowengard building, not knowing that that had a lot to do with her start. Um, but uh, learned a lot about her. Uh, and this was a research project that was a lot of fun, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy as we uh, delve into who Mary Sachs uh, was how important she was. She was known as the Harrisburg's uh, merchant princess because of her business acumen and uh, also known for her philanthropy as the uh, philanthropy princess as well of Harrisburg. She really was an extraordinary woman and I hope you guys enjoy. So Mary Sachs was Russian born immigrant She's actually from present day, I believe if I read correctly in another article, uh, Lithuania, it would have been, but at that stage, Lithuania was still part of Russia. And uh, she came <coughs> She came to America in 1892. She would have been only four years old. And she came over with her mother and two of her siblings, Sarah and Emma. Uh, the father, Wolf Sex, had already gone over four years earlier because it was sort of semi-common that you would have to get an established place in America. The father would go over early, especially uh, with how things used to be back in that era. The family would sort of, when a, plan, a family was planning to say go over to America, the rest of the family, you know, especially like the parents or whatever, would take care of the wife and the children that were over and say, in this case, Russia, uh, while the father went over and sort of prepared, made money, and, and then sent for them when the time was right. Um, so in this case, Wolf had gone over, and he was in a, a small town uh, in lumber and coal region of northern Pennsylvania called Renovo. Uh, now, he was a peddler and a shop owner, and he uh, had actually done reasonably well. He's a pretty entrepreneurial-type spirit, which would explain sort of where Mary learned that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh and uh, so they, they went over to meet him in 1892, and it was around 1900, they wound up moving to Baltimore, and that's where uh, her other sisters, 
Lena, Esther, I guess Morris isn't a sister, at least I hope not, uh, Yetta, and Hannah. Uh, now, she spent a short time there in Baltimore, and at some time, I would assume it'd probably be another four or five years, because otherwise she would only have been like 12 or 14 if it was only a couple years. So I would assume maybe like four or five years, so around 16, 17. She wound up moving to uh, Steelton, Pennsylvania, which is right in the Harrisburg region. And that's where she first uh, worked in a candy shop. And then she wound up working in an installment store where she was promoted and eventually made manager. Uh, and then after several moves, the rest of the Sachs family joined her in Harrisburg area around 1916. She actually began developing her knack for the retail trade at Kaufman's department store on Harrisburg's Market Square. And then in 1910, she left Kaufman's for William Scheisler's uh, highly respected women's clothing store. She worked there for eight years. Now, where a real change came into her life is in 1918, she met Harry Lowengard, who I mentioned earlier in a video. Uh, he operated a printing shop on 3rd Street, where, right where her store uh, is, well, it's no longer operating, but where it was located. Um, and he actually took an interest in her and loaned her money to uh, be able to rent, and, and he rented the first floor of his building so she could open her own clothing store. Uh, she wound up having to carefully plan out how she would lay out the store, because she only had so much capital at that stage. And she also didn't want people to know like she had such a limited stock, so she didn't want to keep it out on the floor. So instead, she was brilliant in that she basically took the customers in these private booths with saleswomen who would present them individually selected garments. And this turned out to be brilliant because the store opened in 1918 with sales of over 200000 in its first year, which is nuts. And the shop quickly, therefore, became one of Harrisburg's premier retail locations, uh, followed by a store in Lancaster in 1921 and Reading in 1923. So by 1920, she actually wound up buying the property right next door at 208 uh, North 3rd Street. Uh, the Lowengard building is 210. That still stands to this day. Um, now this place here, as she bought, was the former home of a Judge John H. Weiss. And she wound up continuing her cooperation with the Lowengard family, who still owned the building at 210. Uh, she was able to add a shoe store, beauty shops, as well as lingerie, cosmetics, and jewelry departments. And beginning in 1925, she started to travel at least once a year to Europe with one of her sisters, Hanna or Yetta, to observe the latest trends in fashion. Uh, she also would make weekly trips to New York to visit clothing manufacturers. Uh, her decision to not deal with Harrisburg salesmen wasn't necessarily, it wasn't a situation where I don't want to deal locally. It just sort of assured her customers that they could always buy a dress there or some kind of clothing that was going to be unique. Um, so it, she was really, once again, she, she had a brilliant strategy. She knew what she loved. She knew where to get her uh, ideas from and really get some really cool fashion things. So you would have from this shop, you'd have the latest fashions from Europe, uh, which is a lot of times where the fashion come from at that time, I assume. And uh, since I'm a fashionista, I mean, you can see who doesn't wear a beautiful Captain American shirt and mix that in with my diabetic shoes and voila. Now, unfortunately, on the night of February 12, 1931, tragedy struck. A fire started in the Harrisburg store's beauty shop. Uh, and basically, the building was a total loss. And you see the building right there. This is it's just a really beautiful Victorian mansion for that judge that she had bought. So that building's obviously gone, and a new one would come in. Uh, and she overcame several financial uh, hurdles because she didn't have a whole lot of insurance. And uh, she uh, wound out rebuilding her store, and she hired local architects, Lori and Green, to design a new facade. And after seeing the work of interior architect Eleanor Lemaire on New York's Fifth Avenue, which that was the big-time clothing and fashion area of New York, she wound up hiring her to design the inside. 
Now, in 1932, on March 26th, the new building opened. Uh, it had 21 departments, and six years later, two additional floors were added, which made room for a nursery, a children's shoe shop, a slipper shop, two other rooms of a word I is French and I can't uh, pronounce, so I'm not going to try, uh, a fitting and alteration room, and a shop for nurse and maid were uniforms. Uh, there were over a dozen consulting rooms, and by the 1950s, her shop had a dorm, doorman and valet parking. Uh, so this really was, like, this area, her shop was just a treasure. Uh, but this was an area that they had a number of different fashion jewelry stores and things like that. And they actually had, by 1954, the Harrisburg and Lancaster stores had a total of 175 employees. Uh, and the Harrisburg store boasted a home goods section paper shop and candy shop. And a few doors down, uh, on the other side of the Lowengard building, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sox, all, Sachs also operated the 212 Man Shop. And it was a clothing store previously owned by Alan Stewart. So sadly, on June 24th of 1960, Mary Sachs passed away. Uh, she was 72, and on the following day, her uh, Mary Sachs shop and the 212 Man Shop closed in observance of her death. And an advertisement read, it is with profound sorrow that we make known the passing of our beloved founder, Mary Sachs. So her sister, Hannah, uh, Hannah, Hannah Sachs Cantor, actually became the president of the Mary Sachs shop and the 212 man shop. Her sister, Yetta Sachs Car Carpenter, served as the secretary and treasurer and continued to manage the Lancaster store, which under her, was, was under her care since 1927. The Reading shop, which was not managed by the Sachs family member, uh, had closed in 1942, uh, and it was cool that the Harrisburg store actually celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1968. Uh, weeks later, the business was sold to Hess's department store, and Hess uh, operated the store until its closing on September 2nd, 1978. So, you know, it was one of those things, it really was a cultural phenomenon, and it's, a, you know, a, a treasure in Harrisburg, and just what she all had to do with the fashion community and what we'll talk about next is what she did with her life that was probably, I would say, was the most important, uh, which is the philanthropy part of her life. Tremendous businesswoman. Uh, that's why they call her the Merchant Princess of Harrisburg. But what she did with her philanthropy was phenomenal. So let's talk. So about she it. had had tremendous success, and it actually didn't take many years. I mean, her first year, she did 200000 And uh, she was... A driving force for many charitable efforts in the Harrisburg area. One of them to note um, is they had this beautify, like your beautiful cities type project, to sort of beautify the cities, to, to bring parks in and those types of things. She was a major proponent of that. She was also uh, gave to count, countless organizations from hospitals uh, and the Boy Scouts to religious institutions and colleges. Uh, and throughout her life, she sought new ways to contribute to the community. Now was the cornerstone of her success and was really why she was so beloved. Um, she just made sure, you know, she never forgot where she came from. She knew how, well, how to, you know, her struggles, uh, she had had her successes. She'd have, I guess you can call them failures or maybe probably more so bumps in the road. And she just sort of went through it and, and never, never allowed it to... Uh, take her down so you know you really have to be impressed by her her tenacity her brilliance uh, but her giving was really what what she was about and who she was and uh, really Harrisburg would be a very different place perhaps if it wasn't for her and you wouldn't have a lot of the beauty that's there today because she really cared about that and actually, an interesting connection, uh, she had met uh, Eleanor Roosevelt at several charity events, and Eleanor Roosevelt said of her, she had a philosophy that filled me with admiration, and uh, since her death, the Mary Sachs Trust has continued Miss Sachs' honorable tradition of giving. Uh, can't say much more about her than that. So Mary Sachs led an extraordinary life extraordinarily uh, successful but just strive to make everyone's life better around her 
And uh, you can visit the uh, store right there for Mary Sachs. Uh, and that whole row there from, I believe it's right next to the Fulton Bank building, is all that area that she used for her stores. You also have her home, which is in the picture here, that is along Front Street. And they have a second placard there. I did not visit that, but it's got to be beautiful because it's right there in front of the Susquehanna River. So I just want to say in closing, this was a lot of fun to do this. Um, she was a really intriguing, treating lady, and she definitely belongs in this heroines of hometown history. Uh, just because of everything that she accomplished, uh, she's definitely someone to look up to. Uh, truly a, a beautiful and kindred spirit. Uh, she uh, really made a huge difference in the world and made it a better place for having been in it. And her charitable trust continues to bless uh, the community uh, and help different uh, charitable groups. And, uh, you know, she made uh, quite the impression in the fashion world. And to this day, her clothing is just very much, much desired. Um, so this was, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this. This was not something I was going to go into things like this and you know, oh, it'll be interesting to a degree. And then you go into it and you're like, hmm, she's a really intriguing woman, really extraordinary human being person that uh, people can really uh, look at and say, this is somebody I'd like to emulate. So I want to say thank you for coming along on another one of our video journeys here. And uh, as always, we'll see you all about town.